do we need to define what art is? Oh, that's Maybe. a bit deep for this conversation. Arts, <laughs> for somebody that's watching, that. there's arts. Yeah. The arts is not picking up a paintbrush and painting no, on a it's... on a canvas every time, is it? So I think you should. Oh, I'm way out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm not... what is <laughs> art to Caleb? Yeah. Tell <laughs> us. I could draw you a picture if you like. You're watching the internet's leading early childhood innovation channel. Each week, we release new videos spotlighting innovation in preschools, kindergartens, and early childhood centers from all over the world. Welcome to Early Childhood Innovation. Today, we're gonna to be sitting down with the owner and CEO of Above and Beyond Education and Care Centers. They've grown from one center to a multi-site organization with five unique and exciting centers. And today, we're gonna to be learning a little bit about that journey where they came from, what the challenges were, and how they got there. So if you're someone who's in a leadership position or interested in being in a leadership position in early childhood, this episode is certainly for you. Make sure you stick around. And by the way, we've also added some timestamp links to the description below. If you're short on time, you can read the description, click on the link, and it's gonna jump you to where you can watch from. So go ahead and check it out below. Make sure you also subscribe as well as hit the little bell icon so you're going to be notified every time we post new content. Well, thanks for having us today. Uh, maybe we could start off if everyone could just go around and introduce themselves and their role at Above and Beyond. That would be great. Sure, I'm Colleen. So I'm the founder of Above and Beyond and I'm privileged to lead the team, basically. Been in early childhood for over 30 years and obviously it's my passion. That's why I'm here. Great. And my name is Caleb and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here for Above and Beyond um, and I take care of a lot of the operational side of the company. My name's Olivia and I'm one of the educational leaders here at Above and Beyond. Um, educational leader means manager to us but we're in charge for the education side of things and I have been working for Above and Beyond since we had one centre so I've been able to be a part of the growth that's oh. happened here. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can tell me the story behind Above and Beyond. Sure. Um, I've been in early childhood forever and ever, had my own centres for probably 30 years, but it was as, and, and during that time, you can imagine the pendulum swings from this is the current in vogue thing, this is the current in vogue, and you swing around and around, and I guess I was looking for what's the absolute bottom line that I wanted. I didn't want to waste my life just doing early childhood, I wanted to be able to impact um, children and families. And somebody gave me a little saying once that said, you know, you mightn't have the flashiest car in the flashiest house, but if you're important in the life of a child, the world will be a better place or some I, something like that. Um, and so that really challenged me and got me thinking. Liv was pretty much on board very early on when we changed the name. We had another, we had other centres first. We changed it to Above and Beyond, um, focusing on doing it really, really, really well. And I decided that the thing that was really important is that apart from the beautiful creative environments and those things, what we want to create for children is a nurturing place where they're safe, they know they're loved, they're secure. And that was kind of the foundation underneath it all. And so the environments are beautiful, but underneath it, so they have the, the love and the security and a beautiful place to grow. Some of the children are with us obviously all day, every day or five days a week. So that was really important. So it was kind of out of that really. The castle was particularly special to me because I guess it was at the time where uh, there was a lot of publicity around our appalling, <coughs> appalling, um, statistics on child abuse mm. and I thought it just isn't good enough in New Zealand. One in five children um, are injured each week mm. in New Zealand and it's, abs you know, it's just disgusting. So I wanted to address that and that's why I wanted a castle. I thought let's, it's kind of symbolic of placing value on the children that are in our care. They need to be treated as if they're princes and princesses and they mm. deserve the best we can give them. So yes, it's a castle, but it's my little thing underneath it. Mm. Yeah, we had a child abandoned at the child, at our child care centre before they were the above and beyond mm. centres. Literally, a child was abandoned and mm. um, he came into our family's care. And we had him for quite some time. Um, and I began to see, this is total sidetrack, man. Do you want this? He loves uh, it. <laughs> so we took this little boy called Ian um, home and he was 
Because um, the mum just like dropped him off at the centre one day and then just didn't come to pick him up. Mm. And had extra, he had an extra bag on his back, didn't he, or something? Yeah. And anyway, we took him home and he became very much part of, became very much part of our family. And then I began to look into what it was that happened to foster children. And at that time, mm -hmm. that was years ago, but at that time, they were moved home on an average of seven times a year. I don't want to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a big responsibility mm -hmm. when you're caring for children to create that um, environment where they're safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm wondering if you can talk me through the journey of the growth from one centre to being a multi-centre now. Well, we've got five centres now. The first one was our Gate Pass Centre and that's inspired by um, Alice in Wonderland. So it's a bit of a crazy centre really. Nothing quite matches. There's all different light, lights and themes and it's really creating an, an environment for the children that's got lots of different layers of creativity so they can go into the room and it's full of lights for example different color lights but or different shades and things um, but then as they look and observe them then they notice that this one matches that one and this one's this color and that one's that color so there's just layers so that was the start um, we've since developed four centers each unique and inspired by either authors or something really particular that's important to us um, we never wanted to do cookie cutter centers um, so yeah, each one of them's a little bit different. No, each one of them's very different. <laughs> very different. <laughs> different feel, different yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very intentional and done with a lot of thought. Oh, then on. there's the um, Dr. Seuss inspired centre. And that's, you know, Olivia reminded me this morning that parents will come in there and go, oh, I wish I was a kid again. Mm -hmm. I'd, love to, I'd love to come and play here. Mm -hmm. Why fit in when you're born to stand out is one of his quotes. And that's kind of the thought behind that one. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. Across the different centres with the different intentional themes, what are some of the challenges at maintaining community? Can we talk about our structure at this point? Might, might, that might lead into the, the structure and the way we... Uh, so we have a structure where we have educational leaders in each of our centres. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we've called them educational leaders rather than managers is we have intentionally removed as much administration from them as possible so that they can concentrate on the teaching and mm -hmm. their teaching team mm -hmm. that they have. So they oversee the education, the, the educators in the centres um, and anything that's outside of the education comes back to our support team. Mm -hmm. um, in this way, we know that we're drawing on their strengths mm -hmm. and, um, and using our support team's strength to support them in their role. So I think the way that we maintain community with the educators is because we have fantastic educational leaders mm -hmm. and they are super passionate about early childhood education and they love their teams and they love the parents and the children. And so we meet with the educational leaders every Friday and we catch up uh, as a core team with them once a week. I think too, for myself, I'm a trained educator mm -hmm. and when you're passionate about it, you usually Automatically, well, not automatically, but the ambition is that you would go into leadership. Mm -hmm. And but sometimes you can get bogged down with all the paperwork that you've got to do and things right. like that. So you get taken away from your passion. Mm -hmm. So this way, we still get to be passionate and lead our team and what we, in, you know, we went to study for, mm -hmm. and still be able to like be in the leadership position. So I think it's pretty special to be able to do that. It means they don't have to get bogged down with washing buildings and carpets and all that sort of thing. That <laughs> Admin and then yeah. some. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me something unique about your curriculum. What what do you think sets above and beyond from other centres? I think our intentional, really intentional creativity opportunity for the children to be creative. So it comes through right from from the, the way the environment is set up for them, and then the experiences that they have within the centre. That would be one. Any addition on that one? Yeah, I think it is yeah. the emphasis on creativity because, you know, like the children that we're involved in their lives and they're learning today, we don't know the workplace that they're going into. Right. It's completely unknown to, mm -hmm. to anybody. And so if you're giving them the tools like creativity, they can work in those environments, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe tricky here, but I'm wondering if you can share a story of a child's creativity from coming to one of the centers. 
Oh, that's a hardy. <laughs> <laughs> One I think of is goes back quite a long time to a little boy, and I don't know if this is the sort of question that you're looking at, but there was a little boy who hadn't spoken. Mm. Um, he was autistic mm. and hadn't, hadn't spoken, and he would have been probably three or four maybe by the time he came to us. And we had a Christmas show, and part of preparing for that was lots of singing and and he stood on the front stage with his microphone and boomed that song out. Wow. Um, and I think that the, our creative, our creativity gave him the vehicle that he just needed to mm-hmm. begin to express himself. So oh, that's wonderful. That comes to mind. Yeah. And it seems within the curriculum, there's a focus on the arts and allowing children to express themselves, as you were just mentioning, through the arts. Where, what was the foundation of that? How did you decide for that to be so prevalent at Above and Beyond? Olivia kind of touched on it before. I think one of our bottom lines is we look for the intentional well-being of children as one of our kind of mantras. What can we do intentionally that will promote the well-being of the children that are entrusted to us? And we explored different different curriculums, different emphasis, and decided that these days it is knowledge is easily attainable, Mm -hmm. you know, flick of a button, but what, what children are going to need are the skills to be able to um, analyze the information that they're getting, mm-hmm. use them, transfer them from one situation to another. Mm-hmm. And so we felt that the arts enabled them to gain those skills. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just obviously, it's the performing arts and it's mm-hmm. um, you know, the visual arts and yeah, the whole spectrum really to enhance that creativity that That's we talked wonderful. about. Which you're going to see for sure over the next couple of days. Oh, yes, yes. Very much looking forward. It's not just visual arts, it's music, it's drama, it's movement. Mm. It's creating, I mm-hmm. guess, is huge. Um, and taking risks to be able to try things and create things. And if it goes wrong, who cares, you know? There's, it's about the process, not the product. And what does it look like in our centres, Olivia? Wow. Well, <laughs> we do have all the expected stuff that you would think an early childhood centre would have paints, paper, um, pencils for drawing, things like that. But then we try to go the extra mile where we bring in artists and um, they work with the children or we've had concerts on a little stage in the back of our playgrounds where musicians come and we had a jazz musician who came and bought like a trombone and, and all these different jazz instruments and the children were having turns and listening to it and things like that. So it's about... Um, bring it in the community as well, along with that. Mm. How else have we done? Art exhibition you've yeah. done. Oh, that's right, we do an annual art exhibition. That's a wonderful opportunity to bring the, the, to bring the community in to see what we're doing. Oh, we had a musician that worked for us, she was an early childhood teacher, and she wrote songs specifically for our children. There was one about how to blow your nose and about Valentine's Day and Christmas, and the children have been able to sing that and practice it and then make their own CD. And it seems to be a favourite thing that we revisit all the time. The Blow Your Nose one was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Can you recite it for us? (laughs) (laughs) And the other thing is we will bring literacy through, obviously, um, into the arts as well. So, and that's an example that you'll see at the moment of this time is when they are, um, they have a story that they particularly love, but they're acting it out um, for the parents. So they create their costumes and then act it out. Um, um, they made puppets and we used an app to put those puppets in a virtual puppet show and so they retold the story, they can record it onto it or they've retold it to their friends as the visuals going. It's just using that technology as well which is pretty cool. Mm. I think whenever we've done kind of brainstorming around uh, the curriculum with the educational leaders and the educators, whatever kind of comes out of that we've always asked the question is what does it look like to go above and beyond above and beyond speaks for itself doesn't it and another way of putting that is this phrase that kept coming up while i was there not by halves not by halves can you elaborate for me if we're going to do something let's do it to the best of our ability i think that's where it comes Mm. to in the opening here we had an opening we had a ball you know and everyone came in there sort of beautiful ball gowns. Yeah. We had a live band and a jester riding a unicycle and <laughs> we invited the whole community. Yeah, we did. The whole business community along That's to the ball. True. Can you tell me about some of the biggest challenges across the multi-sites and how you face them? Well, one that springs to mind for me is uh, around staffing. 
um, what can we say about staffing? <laughs> I, think I, think we started, this, I think we started as that tight, tight team. team. Like there was a, you know, a group of us that would, and it just was everything good about it. And so when that happens, you want to grow it. But then as you bring more people in, it's the challenge of, you know, sharing what that core group has that makes it so special. Mm. And I think consistency for the children as well. When you replace a staff member, it's a pretty big deal. And combining those two facets, there's what Olivia said, we were a really tight team and we could rock it pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> when you, mm. you know, we'd work together and we got on really well. Um, and then you'd bring someone else on and then, you know, it says, Caleb said, you bring a new person into the team and what does that look like? Mm. Um, so keeping that consistency as we've grown has got to have been a pretty big challenge for us, huh? And we've changed the structure several times in order to make it more efficient. Um, so as we grew, we found, you know, how do we, as Liv said, how do we get that core and spread it across five sites? Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did is we had a role a, that was an oversight role from the educational leader. So we had an educational leader in each centre. And then we had a role that went around to ensure that the curriculum was well covered and that, it, that what was happening on the floor was exactly what we wanted to and did reflect our values and who we mm. are as a company. Then as we became more confident, I guess, in each of the educational leaders, Liv's role stepped back from that mm. and has taken her, her own centre. And again, it's to get it established with our, our mark on it, you know, who mm -hmm. we are as, a, as an above and beyond centre. There's advantages as well with the staff, like it certainly is a a challenge but what it does mean is when we have somebody that's returning returning for maternity leave they might not want to be coming back full time one of our values is kindness and so we want to be kind to everybody that we come across including the staff and so what it means is that if an educator is coming back and the centre that they were working in they don't want to return full time but we might have somebody else at another centre that's leaving on maternity leave or something it means that we can we can slot mm -hmm. staff in so although it comes with its challenges to be a multi-site, it, it certainly has its yeah, ups as well. Yeah. It's good. Uh, beyond kindness, can you speak to some of your other values? Courage, punch above your own weight. Do you want to talk about that one a little? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I, do. I love the accountability. <laughs> the tagline on, on our integrity value yeah, is to do the right thing always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, to be honest, haunts me mm -hmm. at my work life and, and home life, to mm -hmm. be honest, because it's so easy to 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 justify or to scrimp or to to do something that's not quite the right thing mm -hmm. um, and I think we do it sometimes so unintentionally not doing the right thing whereas when you've got the tagline in the back of your mind of do the right thing always um, and it comes up from time to time when we are dealing with a parent who oh. it's filming <laughs> If we're, dealing with a, if we're dealing with a parent around a bill, like if, if they yeah. are struggling at yeah. that point in time, um, our support team know our values and they would be looking at do the right thing always and what is the right thing to do in this point in time for this parent is um, to wipe the slate clean and, and, and support the family through what it is that they're going through. And it doesn't matter if we're dealing with an outside contractor who has seemingly might have not done the right thing, but what is the right thing for us to do? The other one that, that is in a little bit of tension with kindness is accountability. Well, they're not in tension, but they can seem to be in Ooh. tension, is that we want, us, we want to be accountable ourselves and we want our teams to be accountable um, to make sure that the job is done and that the job is done really well. So you mirror that with kindness. It, it, kindness isn't a pushover that we're just, oh yeah, that's fine, no, that's good, no, that's sweet, as you've been kind, but it's like actually, kindness mm. is truth-telling, we need to address this, um, but we address it with kindness, mm -hmm. and it's not, you know, there's no shouting or yelling or anything like yeah. that, it's just sitting down and having the courageous conversations, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess any time that we would sit down and have the courageous conversations mm -hmm. is, is because bottom line it's going to impact the children mm -hmm. and what is the best for the children that are in our care and it's to have that courageous conversation with whoever it is. We then started to talk about professional development, which I'm sure is a topic that many of you are interested in. Olivia and I also had a chat about one of the difficulties 
It's that there's so many different ideas and philosophies out there, it can be hard to stay focused in professional development. But by knowing and clearly defining your center's own philosophy, this can make it easier to be selective about different professional development opportunities and stay focused. I think though what we're trying to do, like I have been, been in early childhood as long as Colleen, but I grew up with my mum as a kindergarten teacher. And what you find is um, the professional development can get very on the buzz, you know, like everything's popular at the moment, so we're going to send people to this and send people. Mm-hmm. So having those values again, mm-hmm. that then align with what we're trying to do as a centre really helps. So if you're sure of those, the professional development comes focused. Um, the other part of it is you send one person, they get really happy about it and on this big buzz and they want to bring it back and do awesome things. And because no one else is on their level, it fizzes out. So it's nice we're doing things as a whole team. You know, we've got the option of bringing somebody that fits with our values and what we're trying to do. And then the whole staff can go, you know, because we've got the numbers to be able to do that. And it makes such a difference, I think, with our professional development is it allows them to have a time to talk about it and all be on the same page and implement things. We also, Caleb mentioned each Friday we have the educational leaders Mm -hmm. meet together. We often use that as a time for professional development, particularly around leadership. And often we'll we'll use the um, Global Leadership Summit, which of a series of videos, I guess, and we'll show one of those that will be particularly um, relevant to us at the time. So we spend quite a lot of time on professional development for the leadership, not so much in terms of developing curriculum or how to set up play areas <coughs> or anything, but on actually leading their team. Mm-hmm. I think too we've said that we play to strengths, right? So there's no point sending somebody off on PD that that um, yeah. is not is not that particular staff member's passion. Mm-hmm. It's the same with children. When you're looking at children, you look at their strength. You come from a strength base, not a not a deficit base, and so we do the same with our staff mm-hmm. because we're a team. So those that are strong in one area and weak in another, there'll be another staff member who's strong in there weak areas so we're better to strengthen the strengths mm-hmm. rather than invest a lot of time and money in something that isn't their passion, that's yeah. their weakness. On an operational level, I know innovation, um, I'm, one of the things I'm thinking about is just receiving phone calls. So we'll receive phone calls um, from parents obviously that have settled a child in in the morning and wants to check in, um, might be ringing to say that the child's going to be absent because they're unwell. Um, And so we found that as the parents were ringing individual centres, obviously we would like our educators to be focusing with the children that they've got in their care at the time. And so we changed our phone system around in order to have the phones ring at our support office. Mm. And we have said not one phone call is to go unanswered um, because you never know who's Mm. going to be on that other end of the line that's, Mm -hmm. that's checking in on their child. So we've placed phones in every room um, at every centre and any incoming phone calls will come into our support office and from there we can transfer the call to the educators on the floor in the individual rooms Um, and that's one way that we can value the parents that might be ringing in to know that every time they ring they're going to get somebody at the other end of the phone. Can you speak to perhaps um, occurrences when your educators collaborate? I have the privilege of going around all the centres so I can see what's happening that's awesome at each of the centres and often I'll pinpoint something that's really amazing. It might be the way they transition children from one room to another and then at our, we call it our ops meeting on a Friday afternoon, I'll ask that education leader to speak on that, that the rest of the team can hear it. Um, It doesn't mean they have to necessarily implement it if it isn't going to work for their particular area, but it does give them the opportunity to I guess to think, you know, innovatively, is this, could could I do it that way? Would it be better than what I'm currently doing? And to reflect on their practice. So that's one way we do it. So what we've just heard from Colleen is about how innovation is being reflective and actively seeking ways to improve. Now, what we're going to hear from Olivia is a cool way they do this at Above and Beyond. They create opportunities for staff to visit other rooms and other centers within the network. So it's a way for them to share ideas and learn from each other. Sent staff to, to like, they've got an amazing um, room that's working really well or great ideas. And so I just um, cover them 
so that they can go over and spend time in that room and spend time with those staff, different centres. At another centre. Right? Yeah, at another centre. Done it with my cook lately. <laughs> <laughs> my chef sent her to um, be able to spend time with the one from another centre just because you can see that they're doing something awesome or that they would benefit from the collaboration. Sometimes success can be challenging. Colleen and Caleb told me about the difficulties of growing very fast. You know what we learnt with, was it Tipuna? We had too many new staff. Might be the, I think it was, it was the, the lakes. lakes. So when we opened the Lake Centre, which was our third centre, um, it grew really, really, really quickly, much faster than we had anticipated that it would. It's in a new suburb and we were the first centre there. And it, it grew from zero to full in just a ridiculously short amount of time. And that did give us the speed wobbles because what we couldn't do was ensure that who we were was imparted to the number of staff members mm. that we needed so quickly. We we had staff with us that had been with us for a long time go there, but nevertheless they were one, perhaps of a team of ten all of a sudden. And so that was a bit wobbly for a little while. Um, and I don't know how we could have done it better because I guess we just didn't anticipate the growth. Should we have slowed it down? Maybe we should have, I don't know. I think around the growth too, with um, the amount of staff that we have, and as the centres are growing, we're obviously still employing more. But we have decided that all of the interviews and the employment process happens um, at our head office here, rather than have the educational leaders make make appointments. And that's mm -hmm. just so that we can make sure of who's on the team and what lights each individual staff member's fires, and make sure that we've got uh, the right culture and the right mix as best as we can. Because it's so much more than just the skill set, you know, you can, they can be incredible educators that are awesome, but they're still not the right ones for here. And we've found too that as we've, as we've interviewed staff for a particular centre at a in a particular room, that we can see that, that the potential candidate's not the right fit for that centre or that room, but happen to know that there's going to be a vacancy coming up or that another room is, is growing and so therefore we can guide them into that centre instead of the centre mm -hmm. that they originally applied for. So it's just a way to keep the culture and the values throughout. I think it is the values particularly that we're looking for at an interview because it's relatively easy to upskill people in terms of professional development type things compared to getting their values aligned. I think as each centre has been built and developed, we've learnt a little bit more every time, right? You've yeah. you've done the dance a few times, Liv. So <laughs> every time you learn something more or the ministry changes some piece of legislation and you've got to do it some other way, but with enough um, grit and can-do attitude, you can cross any hurdle that comes your way and as long as you've got a good team, then... You know what else I've done over the years is sometimes we put people on the bus that we don't actually need right now, but we know they're the right people. Yeah. So if we find an awesome person that we know, man, we want you on your team, on our team, then we'll bring them on, but not quite sure where exactly they'll fit. We've often joked too, as we've got an educational leader that's that's fulfilling a maternity cover or whatever at that given time, and they are just excelling and obviously in their sweet spot, but know that it'll be short-lived because maternity covers coming back. We've often joked it's time to build another centre <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we've found our educational leader for the next centre. Yeah. So sometimes the team comes first. <laughs> yeah. On the flip side of finding the perfect staff, I learned that one of the major challenges is having to let go staff when needed. We talked about this challenge as well as many of the other major challenges when running a multi-site organisation. I guess the hardest thing for me is being courageous enough to let staff go and to move them on because you know that you'll pay the price if you don't. Mm. And the other team members and the children will pay the price. That's right. Yeah. And it's just being courageous enough to say this just isn't working. You know, mm -hmm. it's not going to work and I can't see a way forward. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth mentioning too, like it's, it's hard, like it, it sometimes can feel like um, you know, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> it sometimes feels <laughs> yes, like, yes. yes I am, it sometimes feels like the, the organisations that you're working with 
whether it's the ministry or whether it's the health department, no, Dad, go ahead. or whether it's <laughs> or whether it's the the local councils. Sometimes it's seemingly that they are working against you, whereas um, sometimes it feels like they should be working with you to create something. But everybody's got a job to do, and everybody's doing the best that they possibly can. And these organisations that that seemingly make our life difficult are only trying to do the best that they can do. So sometimes it's very easy to get down on and bag other organisations, but all they're doing is the best that they know how and the best that they can possibly do with their legislation and their things that they've got to work with. So as long as we're all knowing that everybody's doing the best that they can in the seat that they're sitting in at that point in time, um, it's very easy to become so nitpicky at each other unnecessarily. That's right, because we are reliant on the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, um, the council. We need all those people to help us get licensed. And we it is really important to work together. All right, well, thank you to each of you for sharing your unique perspectives and your journey of growth here at Above and Beyond. Uh, it's been great learning and I, I can't wait to see more of the centers. All right, that's it for this week. But I'd love to hear if any of our viewers are working in leadership, management, or running their own multi-site organizations. If so, what are some of the challenges that you face? I'd really love to start a discussion, so leave a comment below. Next week, we're going to be visiting Tapuna, which is the Dr. Seuss Center. So make sure you've subscribed and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any of our videos. In the meantime, have a great one and remember everyone's an innovator.